Hey, I'm Kai from Flamenco Explained, and we are here in the workshop of Stephen Hill, one of my oldest and dearest friends. He's been making guitars for 30 some odd years. 37. He's been making guitars in Spain for... 17. I own a couple of his guitars, and they are fantastic. And Stephen is going to explain to us a bit about the action and the setup on a flamenco guitar, what it should be, how you do it, what you should and shouldn't do yourself, all that kind of good stuff. Okay, so we are actually going to be working on this fine instrument, this fine blanca, and uh, this is an instrument built by Tara, Kai's wife, who is the other half of Flamenco Explained. In, it's a very traditional instrument with a spruce top and cypress back and sides, and it's just come back from the polisher, Antonio Ariza, who uh, I consider one of the best polishers in the world, and he's put a lovely, clear um, shellac finish on the instrument. So it's great to have the instrument back in the shop. Tara built this guitar in the one month intensive courses that we run here in southern Spain. It's been polished, we're now ready for the final stretch. So my first question is, what's the difference between setting up a flamenco guitar as opposed to setting up a classical guitar? Well, essentially, the flamenco guitar is a much lower action for a start. That is to facilitate um, the speed that people move around the fingerboard. The setup here, um, obviously on the flamenco guitar, what we're going to be doing is uh, going to bring it to a pretty much standard, uh, sort of on the lower side of, of what we would call a flamenco setup, which if those of you who like numbers, we're going to go to about 2.3 on the treble here and about 2.8 on the bass here. So nice and low, nice and rattly, giving you some, some nice ronqueo, some nice trasteo, some nice sound, flamenco sound. So the first thing we're going to be doing now is checking the fretwork because Tara made this instrument um, obviously a few months ago. It's had time to settle to move around here. So we just need to do a final check to make sure before we string up the instrument that our frets are level so that we have got the best um, or the cleanest action that we get, the cleanest sound and action that we can get. So I'm just going to use this little um, fret rocker and I'm going to place between two frets here so you can check here, does the middle fret rock or not? So I'm just going to run down here, moving it back and forth, and identifying a high fret here. You see, a little rattle there like that, and a little rattle there. So we have a tiny little bit of movement, almost nothing here, and a tiny bit of movement here as well. Okay, so this I'm going to start working on this area here, and I'm going to use a fret file here, which is a file set up in this block here, and I'm going to identify that high fret by blocking off previously uh, the, the frets that are, I'm not going to be working on. I don't want to be filing the whole thing. I'm just going to be what we call spot filing here. So I'm just going to simply identify in the memory that I have of where those high spots were, just to bring down the high fret here. And of course, it's not cutting anywhere else but where I want it to be cutting here. Some people call this procedure, they call it a sort of a fret dress. So, you know, you need to go to a maker really, because to do this on your own at home is, is pretty challenging. You know, you need to have the right file, you need to have uh, fret crowning tools, fret rockers, and a good setup, a good clean bench area here. And it's not something that you can just sort of, you know, crack out any old how. It's something that needs to be done with a lot of refinement to get the best out of it really. Most important, I would believe, it would be in the base area here, the, first, the second, third, fourth positions here. If you've got, you've got a lot more string movement, what we call string envelope running from the base string here. So if you've got problems with your fretwork, it's going to be much more noticeable than anywhere else is really. Especially also that sometimes the third string, second fret as well, something we need to identify with. So I'm just doing the spot file here, and then I'm double checking again to make sure you can see some little remnants of the uh, metal work that's come off and sat down on this now on the ebony here. And I'm just going to be checking that. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So now I've done my fret filing here, my high spots here, I'm going to come with this diamond um, fret file here. This is available for a company called Stuart McDonald in the States. And what I'm going to do is I'm, I can identify the high spots here as a sort of a flat area. If you think of a fret as having a crown, like this, a round crown, so that the string takes off from a midpoint here rather than from a flat on the fret, it's taken off from a high point. If it was a flat fret, 
you get like a, a sitari sort of sound. You get a, like a, a, a weird buzz here. So the fret has to have a crown to it. So by filing it with my fret file here, I have little flats and I want to then remove those flats here. So I'm just going to come in with my fret file here, just working on those frets that I knew were, were high here. Bringing back the crown, as we say, making sure that the fret is round at the top here. You can have the world's best built guitar with the sound and the feel and everything like that. But if the action setup is not correct and the, the fretboard doesn't feel right and there's high frets here and there, it's really going to be an instrument that you will immediately, in a sense, just discard. You think, well, this just doesn't sound right. It just doesn't feel right. So I'm going to pass on that instrument. So we have to make sure that everything is as best as it can be for the comfort that we want here. So once the fretboard has been leveled, we're just going to polish everything, which is a really important aspect because the fretwork has to have a polish to it. Otherwise, you're going to really feel it as a sort of gritty, grainy feel, especially on the treble string, on the bass strings, you can feel it like, like that. So you really need to really polish these and then your, 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 the feeling of the string on the fretwork will be like a glide rather than a sort of a roughness. So it's really, really important. You're not going to do much um, electric guitar um, bending, bend, yes. but even so, the feel of the fretwork is vital here. So I'm using what I would call a microfine pad here, which is like a foam pad here, which is very easy to do at home if you really want to do that, but mask off your fingerboard here like this. And you can buy one of these and you can give it a really good little clean as well, which polishes the fretwork here, all the way down here, making sure you've covered all the fretwork here. And then I'm gonna use what we call steel wool, which is a four zero steel wool. And this is going to just finally polish the fretwork and the ebony as well, just bringing back that clean look that we want to see. The final aspect is going to be a little coat of lemon oil. So we're just going to do a few frets at the time here and we're just going to rub it in here, which does two things. It cleans the board, it protects the board and of course it does make it look very much more beautiful as well. The fingerboard, as most of you know, has not got any finish on it like the rest of the instrument. So it's quite good to use something to slow down the absorption of humidity in and out of the ebony. Even though ebony is a very dense material, it can still absorb and release moisture. If you have a very, very dry atmosphere, the first thing you notice is your frets pop out the side of the neck. It's because the fretboard simply has shrunk with the, um, the low humidity. And conversely, if you've got a very high humidity, then you won't feel the frets popping out, but you'll start to get distortion uh, going on. Fret, the fretboard, as well as expanding and contracting sideways, also expands and contracts longitudinally. So in very powerful changes of humidity, your fretboard actually longitudinally can change, can go back or forward. Does that mess with your intonation? It messes up with your intonation, with the playability, all these things. So obviously the older the instrument and the more mature the timbers and the older the timbers, the less that is going to have an effect. But if you're buying a new instrument, you do need to take great care of your humidity controls, um, especially in winters with, hu with uh, low humidities in your house here. So you know, my advice is always to buy um, a little sort of um, humidity packs or something like that, which is going to keep you keep inside your case, which is going to keep a relative humidity of around 50% which is a, like a safe humidity. Si above 60, you start getting more humid. The sound will be affected as well. Below 50, 45 is fine. 40 is fine. 35 is fine. Below 35, over long periods of time, problem. So keep your humidity around 45 to 50. Tell us about options that you have for a gold bear lord. If we don't have a gold bear lord, it's not an option. If you're going to be playing proper flamenco, you're going to be your gold plays. And it's a bit like these IKEA beds that they have this um, um, thing which basically emulates or simulates 17,000 rolls on your mattress. So if you imagine 17,000 hits on the sample with your nail, you're going to get a bit of a problem here. So we're going to use this very thin acetate here. Uh, it's transparent. Traditionally, you would have white gold pedals because they didn't have this form of transparent material. So the, the white gold pedal is 
is uh, like a traditional thing, and it did not cover the, the rosette, because obviously if you cover the, the rosette with a white gold bead, or you can't see the rosette. So one mistake people make is when they're using a transparent gold bead, or is to actually cut around the outside of the, of the rosette. But because we're transparent, we can cover the rosette, and actually it encourages better long life of your instrument, because your thumb, the pull guy, is not actually touching into the rosette. I've done quite a few repair work where I had to literally repair this whole zone in mo new mosaic. So we're going to cover the full rosette so that we don't mark it with our thumb when we're playing here. And we also, that it protects for gold players and things on the right hand as well here on the, on the treble side here. The most important thing is, is surgical cleanliness. So I'm just going to use my hand to take away any of the dust that we may have here like this. The worst thing is to put the gold piece on and find that you've got one of your hairs stuck in there. I'm just yeah, gonna... And this is not an easily reversible operation. I not think at we all. want to be very clear about not that. Not at all. These are not electrostatic um, things. These are like straight on. So I'm now going to take away not all the backing of this, just like a third here like that, okay? And then I'm going to hold it in this position here. Now, this is the moment, and I'm going to lay it on the base side next to the bridge as the first position there. Then I'm going to go to the treble side, and I'm going to run my finger along, along the bridge, laying it only right up against the bridge. And now, I'm going to arc with my thumb, change to my thumb, I'm going to arc my thumb Little by little here. And I'm slowly, as I'm moving forward to the left, I'm just peeling off the backing, but not, not peeling off too much, because we don't want it to suddenly make contact. It's that sudden making contact which can give you the air ball here. Okay, so I'm almost there. Again, this last minute is the most important, just to not pull it off too soon, and it's just off. There we go. Okay. So now, the magic moment of taking off that brand new iPhone look thing. I once forgot to take this, la this layer off and I sent the guitar to the client. After about three weeks, he said, the gold pedal is just like, looks terrible. It looks all like bits and things falling off everywhere. And I said, like, oh my God, what, what happened? What happened? Maybe I had to send the instrument back to me. And then in a flash of inspiration, I realized I had forgotten to take this thing off here like this. So I said, is there a little film on there? Can you pull it off? He said, yeah. So he pulled it off, of course, it was immaculate. So. Don't forget to take your little filmy bit off here. Here we go, we're pulling this off here. One gold bit off. So, talk to me about bones. Bones. Nuts and saddles. Nuts and saddles, okay. And do they need to be bone? If you're a vegetarian, you could opt for something which wouldn't be bone. Um, which would be more ethical to your beliefs. Um, and there are materials called tusk, T-M, tusk, mm. T-U-S-Q, I think it is, which sort of emulates the density and structure of bone. And some people even say that it's even better than bone. So whatever your choice, really, you, the idea is to have a good, dense material here. Tara has made this beautiful nut here. It slides in very nicely. So we're going to set that in its position there. And you never glue nut or saddle in place. Never gets glued in here because these must be removable items because you want to be able to take those out, adjust them, lower the action, raise the action, or change them, for instance. So I'm going to place this now in its position. I'm going to put my hand inside. Some people won't be able to put their hands inside because their hands are too big or they don't know how to do a Houdini like with their hands like this. So I'm going to put my hand inside and I'm going to position this this bone in its right position there, which is dead central in the, what we call the tie block here and the, the slot. And I'm just going to gently push it against itself. I don't want to push down to the sand ball without my hand inside here. I don't want to force it down because I'm being too, too much strain onto the sand ball. So I'm using my hand inside to have opposing pressure to make sure we've got a good seatment to the bone there. Okay. So now I believe we are pretty much ready for the final stringing up. You talked about the height at the 12th fret. Yes. Uh, so my question would be, if you have 
too much or too little height at the 12th fret. How do you determine whether it's the saddle or the nut that you need to raise and by how much and all that stuff? Yeah. So here we have a handy little device. This is a saddle setup jig. Mm -hmm. And it consists of a straight side here. And I have a little space on here which emulates the height of the fret there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to place that in its first position here, like that, first, first string position, and I can simply measure the action. 2.2. 2.7. So we did previously set up this instrument, so that for me is about right, because we're going to have a little bit of pull up with the tension of the string which will probably bring us to 2.3 and 2.8, which is around about the ideal. You can't always say that though those numbers should be what you should always stick to, because some instruments, they want to go lower, they want to go higher. So you say, yeah, you can say, well, I can feel this instrument could go lower. It's tight enough to go lower. And you want to go as low as you can to give yourself a relatively clean action, but a great feel to the left hand. But you don't want to go too low, otherwise you're going to, what we will call apagar, you're going to stop out the strings. The strings are not going to be able to sing enough. They're going to be constantly choked by themselves uh, rattling on the fretboard. So it's a fine, fine balance between the tension of the strings they're going to be using and the action and the style of playing that you want to be doing. So I think we're about okay now to start the initial stringing up and then we're going to uh, show what we need to do at the nut to make sure the nut is correct in relation to the saddle. You said about 2.2, 2.3 on the treble side, 2.7, 2.8 on the bass side for flamenco. What if it's a yeah. classical? If it's a classical guitar, um, the standard height would be three millimeters on the treble and four millimeters on the bass. Uh, that's going to give you a relatively clean action. Some guitars, like in the sort of 60s and 70s, for instance, the uh, Ramirez, they were like 4.5 on the bass and 3 mil or even 2.8 on the treble. Oh, wow. Quite a big difference. And you could see yeah. this great big rake to the fingerboard down here and the saddle was arched to, to encompass this increase of action in the, action in the bass, which right. would obviously give you, the idea is to give you as clean as possible sound, especially in the lower registers, which will be buzzing on the, on the F sharp, on the G, something like that. So, but for Flamenco, we're not so bothered about having uh, this super clean action. So yeah. we go lower, we go lower. Classicals, yeah. they always want the purity of sound, right. so we go higher. Well, and you also get a little more power as you raise the action, you so it's always a trade-off. You know? exactly, like, exactly, yeah. You certainly get, you get more power, so you can really push the bass on, on, a, on a classical instrument yeah. without it breaking up. And uh, so, yeah, it's a question of power and, and also the player as well, how much power the player actually has, how much pressure on his thumb yeah, he has, how much distance he wants, yeah. the pulsation is like and the... Exactly, and, and also the instrument itself has, you know, we think that guitars are all the same, and the only thing that's going to change it is the string. Um, that's not so. Each guitar has its own, as you say, yeah. pulsation, and it, that's in terms of how you build the instrument, you're going to have more or less uh, tightness, which doesn't come from the string length, it comes from the way the top is responding. That, the initial kick and feel of the soundboard here is what is going to change the feel on the right hand of the string. Yeah. It's going to give you a different form of tension, including the angle that you have over the saddle here. The higher the angle, it changes the, the tension as well. Yeah. And the break angle, obviously, if you're using the 12 hole yes, versus the 6 hole. becomes lower, yeah. But it's curious because that, that technically does give you a harder action, a harder feel to the right hand. Yeah. But it's not always so. There's, there's a certain mysteries that go on with the way the soundboard is working, which will give you that string feel. All right, so time to string up the guitar. And we brought a set of Labella 2001 Flamenco strings, hard tension, which I think is what we like on this guitar, but we don't know. We haven't really met this guitar yet. It previously uh, had long. normal tension. Uh, we strung with normal tension. And we did uh, have, I think, take the decision that we could go to a harder tension yeah. on that. So we're going to start with the first and the sixth string. And yeah, these Labella 2001, which I really like the 2001, actually on your recommendation, Kai, yeah. great string. Now, one very little important aspect is you would find that, especially with French polish finishes, that we often mess up greatly the back of the breed. So 
If you guys and girls want to buy yourself a little bit of hard plastic, in fact, the offcut from a gold pedora or something like that, it's very useful. Or and even simply a piece of cardboard. A piece of cardboard or, or the string packet or something yeah. like that. You can place that just behind the string here and then just with a couple of bits of tape here, hold that in position. And then that's going to save all those markings that you're going to get. French polish, it's absolutely advisable to do that because it will make a big mess. So here, I, what I do is I put a little bend with my nail, just allow the string just to pop up nicely into here. Now this is a 12th hole setup, so we're 12, uh, 12 holes, double holes here. And uh, I'll just show you what I do with that. So I've gone in the false hole. Now I'm going to go in the real hole, which is the one that was going to go to the nut here. I've gone through like that. And then I'm just going to, on these base strings, I'm simply going to put it behind there, so it's looped behind, and I'm going to then trap it behind the bone. It must be behind the bone here. Pull up, just to straighten that, tighten that in here like that. And now I'm going to go to this end in here. A very simple way to fix the strings on the head here is I'm going to place this thing through the hole. Then I'm going to come above, like here. And then I'm going to bring the string round underneath here. And you can see I can then loop it back round again. And it's going to then grab the string here. So I'm wrapping the string underneath the string here and I'm going to pull it. And as I turn this here, I'm just going to make sure I pull it and it should fall into the string, string hole there. Rock solid. Okay, first string here. Come in the, the extra hole. Come in the real hole here. Now at this point here, to prevent the classic flip out of a first string or a third string, whatever it might be, what you do is you take the loop here and turn it like this, clockwise. And then place the string, the end of the string, through the loop that you've turned clockwise and then pull it into its tensioned position there. And that is a rock solid loop in the end here which cannot come out. It's really important now. Back down in here. So again, I'm going to come under the string here, take up all the slack here and then back down above there. And that's just going to be pulling into the loop here. So we have now string one and string six on board. At this point, just make sure that the, the nut is actually seated correctly on its width here. So it's not sticking out one way or the other. The saddle we did previously, and now we're ready to start the setup. So what's left? Well, from what we could uh, see by sitting up with our saddle setup jig here, the action was correct here. But it doesn't mean that that is correct. So that could, if that's high, it's gonna, it's gonna offset that, it's gonna change that here. But the setup we did with that meant that the saddle is in the right position. So we set up to the saddle, but we not set to up the, the saddle. It's really important, if you're building a new instrument, what we would do is when we set up the final setup, we would always do the nut first. If you set up the saddle and then the nut, if the nut was very high and you set the saddle, you set the action here at your, what you wanted and you suddenly found that this was high, you'd have to put that down which would change that. I was showing you, demonstrating with my jig here, just to have a look to see where the, set, the setup was because Tara had already made this and I knew it was pretty much about right. But normally with a new saddle here, we would set that up but to get the final setup we would start at the nut here. Looking at the nut here, what I'm looking for is when I press down in front of the second fret here, I'm looking at the clearance that I have between the string and the first fret here. And it must have a little bit of clearance, not much, but a little bit here. So I'm just gonna run through, tapping it down with my finger, and you can see a little bit of bounce there here. It's about right but I think I can set up the third string a little bit more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the third string out of its slot here and I'm going to take a pencil and I'm going to make a little pencil mark in the slot here. Then I'm going to take the appropriate file for the job here and I'm going to, by having the pencil in there, I can see exactly what I'm doing. If you don't have pencil there, you could be filing, you don't know what you're doing at all. So the pencil means I can see if as soon as I remove the pencil, I know I'm working on the actual bone height itself. So I'm just going to start that 
and at the moment it just has yeah. removed the pencil apart from the very tip. So I'm just going to, now I'm working, now it's completely clean now, I'm going to come back here and I'm just going to do another little marking point here and I'm just going to double check that that is correct. Yeah, correct. So we're lowering the third string a little at the nut because there was a little too much play. A little bit too much height here. Front. Yeah, so now I'm going to pop the string back in here again like that and I'm going to test it again. You see here, there's a little bit of movement here. And that's what you want. You want a we want a little movement. bit of movement, but I think we can go even a little bit more here. Now, the pencil that I put in there is something that you can happily remove for, if you're using clear nylon, you need to remove any pencil mark because it will show up as a dirty mark in the bottom of the, underneath the string. Conversely, on the bases here, it's really important to have some form of pencil lead in there, which is the lubricant for the string to travel in the slot. If you don't have that, you get like sort of movements and things. So I just want to check that I do have pencil lead in there. I do, but I'm going to increase it just a small amount here. And I think I can also just touch also this slot here. It feels like a tiny bit tight. There we go. That's much better. So if the nut is too high, you can always lower the slots. But if the nut is too low... If the nut is too low, no you have much. a problem. Yeah. You could either mm, do the fix and put a shim underneath it, or you make a new nut. If you're not a luthier and you don't have a luthier le near you, then obviously the only remedy is to, is to put a space on there with a bit of uh, veneer or something like that. But sometimes the problem is only in the base. It just rattles in the base in the open yeah. position, but the treble's fine. So if you were to put a shim of a piece of 0 0.5 veneer in there, it would be way too much. So what you can do is you can actually sand away part of the veneer so it wafers down to nothing and has your height that you're looking for just to raise up the base or, or conversely the treble. So yeah, so these little details are critically important here. Guitars ask you all sorts of things. The guitar asks a lot of us, but this guitar is asking me just to touch those slots, just to sort of finalise the setup here. Okay, so now, double checking again, that's better. The flow of the string over the nut is very important. If it's too flat in there, you're going to get like a false sound, you're going to get like a, a sort of a whine or a buzz, a false sort of thing. It's not going to be seating and have the yeah. correct pressure. Conversely, if you go too steep, it's going to start to break the string, especially on the first and the fourth, it's going to start to break the string and yeah. it, will sound, it will sound strained. It's just a beautiful flow over the bone here so that it equalizes the tension down onto the bone here. So here we have the finished instrument set up and ready for playing. And uh, We've worked on all the aspects here, so I believe that this is going to be the best this guitar can give in this stage of its life. Guitars always improve and change, uh, but this is ready for, its, uh, ready for its debut. I think it's really important to say also with a new instrument that you get a new instrument, it's always worthwhile, even though it's come from a top luthier, there are different differences of opinions and different ways to set up an instrument, but I think it's always worth to go to someone who you trust to do a, a sort of a setup, a new setup, just to make sure everything is, is in tip-top condition and that's going to make your playing experience uh, all the more worthwhile, all the, all the better. And the other thing is that different players might want a different setup on yep. the same guitar. So just because someone says this guitar is perfectly set up doesn't mean that it's perfectly set up for you. Correct. Um, you know, so a lot of guitars you know, I tell people, just because the guitar doesn't feel perfect right now, it doesn't mean it's not, you know, if you love the guitar for a lot of other reasons and you yeah. feel like, eh, it's a little too hard to play or a little yeah. too soupy, soft, yeah. like you can do something about that or at least make sure you can't before exactly, getting yeah. rid of a guitar that could be completely salvaged with just a good setup. Yeah. I mean, obviously points to look out for in terms of buying an instrument, for instance, if you, you know, <clears throat> the action is already quite high, for instance, and there's no room to go down on the saddle here, it's a bit of a warning and it's a brand new instrument. It's a warning sign, so you know you need to know right. what the guitar is capable yeah. of. And if it's really high there, but it's also a really high saddle, you yeah. know. You know you can come down. Yeah. And you know, you're high here and you're high here, great. You know, you've got room to come down. 
And as you said, it's all to do with the feel that you want for the instrument. So it's always worthwhile getting the instrument checked over by a pro. So I think that is ready to roll. Thank you.